Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'd like to start by uh, thanking the organizers for the invitation to present today. The title of my presentation is How to Set Up a Minimally Invasive Surgery Program, uh, and I will focus on how this pertains to uh, cardiothoracic surgery. These are my disclosures. I will be covering five points today. Uh, number one, understand the science of innovation and change management. Number two, uh, handle the politics. Number three, prepare the team. Number four, take on bite-sized skills and thus risks. And number five, learn from others. Uh, get a mentor or proctor. So just starting with our, our first point, uh, I think uh, there are many ways of defining um, innovation, um, but I think the uh, simplest uh, definition is to make a change that creates value. Um, change usually means pain for most and excitement for a few. Uh, and hopefully, as the surgeon, um, we are excited to embark on a new project. Um, the value question is important as we consider uh, for whom. Uh, it is quite difficult to define value as there are many perspectives to consider. Um, but I would think that um, the most important perspective is that of the patient and the community at large. So we have to be creating value ultimately for our patients. Um, each of us uh, will see value differently. Certainly the institution will be concerned about costs um, as most new procedures involve an outlay of funds initially um, and uh, the risks associated with uh, embarking on a new procedure. Um, the innovation adoption curve is an important one to uh, consider. Very few of us will be true innovators when we take on a new procedure, um, but uh, many of us may be early adopters. Um, most of us will be in the early majority. Um, beyond this, uh, the late majority and laggards uh, usually just come along for the ride and uh, usually isn't too much novel about the procedure by the time uh, uh, these individuals come on board. Um, the challenge for any new procedure is to make the uh, leap from the early adopter column to the early majority column and most new procedures or technologies never make that jump and therefore um, become a little bit of a fad uh, and fade away um, without establishing uh, um, themselves in the market. The other curve uh, I invite you to consider is the hype curve. Um, it sort of illustrates the mindset um, of uh, most of us involved with taking on a new procedure. Um, the initial experience is associated with a peak of inflated expectations. Often the expectations are thoroughly unrealistic, uh, but we're not aware of this. So we start a procedure and we encounter early success and then early failures and complications uh, or bad outcomes. Uh, we then uh, get quite disappointed. Uh, most of us uh, uh, might give uh, the procedure away at this point, uh, but those that persist then uh, attain uh, the part of the curve known as the slope of enlightenment. Um, and then once we gain competence or mastery, uh, we'll achieve the uh, the productive uh, phase of this curve in the far right, where we ultimately understand where the procedure sits um, in reality, and we are able to select the correct patients uh, to apply the procedure on. Um, I think it's important that we accept and respect that there will be a learning curve with any new procedure, um, and this is associated with an improvement with experience um, or over time. The shape of the curve, the learning curve, will depend on many things. Um, experience of the surgeon and the team, um, the culture of the uh, workplace, the existing skill sets, uh, etc. Uh, but expect that for many of us, it will be a steep and uncomfortable learning curve. Uh, but don't forget, uh, when you're getting down um, during the early part of the learning curve, that um, a steep learning curve does mean rapid progress is being made. I think it's important to consider what case volumes are required 
um, to achieve and surmount a learning curve, I would suggest that we would need at least 30 cases for most complex uh, surgical procedures per year as a minimum. I would um, think that it's important to measure uh, our learning curves. Um, and here, for instance, is my VATS lobectomy learning curve. Uh, where I've plotted procedure length in minutes over um, a series of about 100 uh, initial cases. And you can see the, uh, the um, line of best fit there shows the a fall in the length of procedure uh, over this time. Uh, this is a, another learning curve of mine relating to thoracotomy aortic valve replacements. And you can see that uh, when I plot the cross clamp and bypass time, uh, that after about 50 cases, the learning curve starts to uh, level off. And then as I take on more complex patients, uh, there's a slight rise in the uh, operative times towards the right side of that uh, diver. Um, this is an important uh, theory uh, one should be familiar with uh, regarding the um, uh, levels of competence one achieves. Um, Hopefully, we never quite start a procedure with uh, unconscious incompetence, but that we start it um, being consciously uh, not so competent, where you know that you don't know how to do something and it bothers you. Uh, hopefully, we very quickly move uh, after 30 or 50 cases to a phase of conscious competence, where you know that you know how to do something, but it still takes a great deal of effort to achieve it. And then as we attain uh, mastery, we enter the phase of unconscious competence where you know how to do something and it's second nature um, and you feel fresh at the end of the procedure. The um, challenge is great with minimally invasive cardiac, cardiothoracic surgery, but I think it's important to recognize that it's not intrinsically more complex than open surgery. Um, but really starting a new program involves the successful coordination of multiple learning curves and an important shift from a surgeon-centric approach to one that enhances the role of other team members. Um, this differs fundamentally from learning a new open procedure where the platform is largely the same. So moving on to uh, point number two, um, I would say uh, we need to handle the politics, uh, usually well before starting the first procedure. Uh, one needs to make sure that our line managers and hospital management are agreeable to starting a new procedure. I think the process of writing a business case is very useful and probably mandatory in uh, most instances today. Um, in the business case, uh, we will be forced to consider budgetary implications of a new procedure, uh, certainly capital purchase and consumable costs. Um, we need to articulate the benefits to patients, to uh, the surgical department and to the institution. Uh, we need to articulate the risks to these stakeholders and what strategies we will put in place to mitigate such risks. Um, we usually have to submit these uh, documents to a new procedure committee or an ethics committee in some cases and get approval. Um, it would be wise to get support from your surgical colleagues um, and it would be wise to get support from other collaborating teams and their respective leaders, such as cardiology, anesthesia, perfusion, intensive care. Uh, it is important to uh, prepare the team. Um, we need to get team buy-in, um, and we need to select key members from each um, skill group to um, join us in this uh, often initially painful journey. And we need to select the correct members according to their skill, uh, their resilience to um, put up with initial hardship and their enthusiasm for the particular procedure at hand. Um, we need to communicate widely, and I can't emphasize enough uh, how important this step is. Um, and then hopefully uh, as a team, we get together and train together uh, attend wet lab simulation sessions, uh, dry runs in theatre, and hopefully get the opportunity to visit established centres. Um, I would encourage you to write down your uh, team protocols and revise this as you progress through uh, your case experience. 
Uh, this facilitates group learning, but importantly facilitates team expansion in time. Here's a detailed protocol. Uh, I've put up the first and last page of a four-page document relating to the conduct of cardiopulmonary bypass uh, for my right anterior thoracotomy AVR cases. Uh, the perfusion group and I sat down and wrote down everything we could think of that might be different or at variance to how I would do an AVR through a stenotomy. Um, you need to appreciate that any one team member can sink the ship with these uh, um, endeavors and it's no longer really all about the surgeon. Um, and we need to recognize that cases will take longer initially. I would suggest we use the same team members for every case initially and then introduce new members either not at all or very very gradually. And it's important to meet regularly to discuss progress, debrief cases um, and discuss how to um, get past obstacles that, that are encountered. Um, point number four here is take on bite-sized skills and the associated risks. I think it's important to deconstruct the procedure if it's at all possible into small size skill sets and practice the skill sets whenever possible. Um, don't add or layer complexity until proficient at each component. If you do, you exponentially increase the risk of failure of the procedure. And uh, for instance, here when I started um, thinking about doing thoracotomy aortic valve replacement, I broke up the skill sets into peripheral cannulation and the conduct of peripheral bypass. Uh, there's a whole uh, lot of um, skill sets inherent in achieving peripheral cannulation safely and uh, maintaining venous drainage, for instance, uh, on bypass. Um, we had to get used to using one shot or long-acting cardioplegia. Certainly handling long-shafted instruments were new, and so I practiced them on open cases. Uh, not tying with a knot pusher or using the core knot device was new, and certainly getting used to a limited uh, amount of surgical exposure was uh, stressful and, uh, and new. Um, I would think that you need to troubleshoot and plan your exit strategies uh, for each of these uh, points in the procedure. For instance, if you couldn't cannulate peripherally, where are your alternative cannulation sites? Um, dealing with poor venous drainage, um, bleeding, uh, failure to progress, and how you'd convert to an open procedure safely. And number five, perhaps the most important uh, step, is to uh, learn from others by, by um, getting a mentor or proctor. Uh, you should try and visit as many surgeons as possible or watch their videos if you can't visit. Um, getting uh, someone who can mentor or proctor you, um, who's already surmounted the learning curve, um, is important. I think it's also important to interact with other surgeons at similar um, early or different stages of development. You can join or create a community of learners, um, certainly cross-fertilization of ideas and techniques um, as you separately embark on your learning curves is extremely important. Uh, the emotional support uh, you give each other is uh, equally important. There are wonderful uh, websites these days um, and online learning opportunities. This is one I've been using recently, created by Daryl Perlstein, uh, with many, many videos of uh, robotic uh, thoracic procedures, including um, lobectomy procedures uh, that vary in difficulty. Um, the other resource I've been using is the STS learning modules relating to robotic uh, cardiac and thoracic surgery um, and certainly there is a huge library of um, presentations there available that are extremely useful. Um, so finally, uh, I would just finish by saying Mark Zuckerberg's Facebook motto, move fast and break things, does not work in cardiac surgery. Uh, the key for uh, startups in minimally invasive cardiothoracic surgery is careful, methodical, stepwise progress until one day it is just another day at work. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to present and please reach out to me if I can help in any way at this uh, email address. 
and I wish you uh, all the best of luck in your uh, new procedures.